Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. We welcome today to the International Institute for Strategic Studies Dr. Abdiwali Muhammad Ali, Prime Minister of Somalia, to address us on the theme, A Moment of Opportunity in Somalia, Building the Case for a Somali Solution to Instability. I was last in Mogadishu in the late 1980s, carrying bags of shillings into taxis for a short run around the capital, trying to meet ministers in bullet pockmarked buildings. Since then, Somalia has descended into official failed state status for some 20 years and is now the unhappy host nation for al-Shabaab militants as well as for pirates threatening the free flow of maritime traffic. The Somalia I visited had a north and a south, but was a single state. Since then, Puntland and Galmadug have appeared on the unsettled national and federal scene, while Somaliland still seeks to assert its independence formally. Numerous national peace and national reconciliation conferences have been convened, a number of peace accords negotiated, constitutional conferences held, and various intervention forces deployed. The country remains bereft of state institutions, governance mechanisms, normal commercial activity, and day-to-day -day normality. All friends of Somalia, of Africa, and indeed of people anywhere, must hope that this sad state of affairs is on the genuine road to repair. Indeed, it's against this torrid background that tomorrow's London Conference on Somalia takes place, involving as it does virtually every institution, group, and state that has an interest in a stable and secure Somali state. The IISS has analyzed for over 30 years the problems of stability and peace in the Horn of Africa and has focused often on the specific case of Somalia, where we, which we have covered in all of our publications from the Adelphi series through to strategic comments and sadly too, of course, our armed conflict database. Dr. Abduwali brings to his position academic training as an economist, achieved variously at Somali National University, Vanderbilt, Harvard, and George Mason University. He has worked for the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University and has had spells both at the World Bank and the UNDP before being appointed Prime Minister in June 2011. Mr. Prime Minister, we look very much forward to hearing your plans for Somalia, your thoughts on this London conference, and most of all, to your grounds for cautious optimism on the way ahead for your country. Thank you, sir. Thank you, John, for uh, your kind introduction and your kind remarks. Um, Dr. Chimen, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for the opportunity to speak before you today. My vision is for a secure, stable, and prosperous Somalia, a Somalia at peace with itself and with its neighbors, where its citizens can go about their daily lives in, a sa in safety and provide for their families with confidence and dignity. A resurgent Somalia, a tolerant Somali society where conflicts can be resolved peacefully, built on respect for traditional Somali culture, religious values, and way of life. A Somalia with an inclusive and accountable system of government that represents all of its people and in which all Somalis can feel that they have a stake. Achieving this, of course, represents a huge challenge, but it is not a utopian dream. It can be done, and we are closer than many people think. In fact, a recent report by the BBC cites a study which found that, despite being described as the world's most failed state, Somalia is achieving standards of living that are equal or superior to many other African nations. The country ranks in the top half of the African countries on several key development indicators, and in fact only came near the bottom on three out of 13 indicators. It may also surprise many that two northern Somali ports account for 95% of all goat 
and 52% of all sheep exports for the entire East African region. Now, of course, despite these achievements, our society continues to be plagued by violence, poverty, illiteracy, and hunger. The lack of peace and security, of uh, good and democratic governance, of policy, of a policy and legislative environment that can harness the entrepreneurial genius of our people and spread the benefits far and wide has undoubtedly contributed to this state of affairs. Ladies and gentlemen, Somalia's problems are long-standing and complicated. Solving them requires a serious and honest partnership between the transitional institutions, the African Union, the United Nations, and the broader international community. But primarily, Somalia is a sovereign nation, and ultimately, it is destiny rests in the hands of its own people. Somalis must make their space with your help and assistance to solve their own problems. AMISOM, African Mission in Somalia, has been doing this alongside Somalia's Army Forces, helping to provide the growing security space we need for the political process to flourish. And we cannot thank them enough for their commitment and sacrifice. They have made an incalculable contribution to bringing us to a place where we can see the way forward. As I speak, the United Nations Security Council is considering a resolution to expand AMISOM and provide it with the necessary tools to achieve its task of supporting us in our endeavor. It remains our fervent hope that this resolution will be adopted. I can tell you that now, I can tell you that we now have a genuine window of opportunity for Somalis to achieve the vision that I have just described. Last week in Garoe, where I used to volunteer as a university lecturer during my summer vacations, we held the second national constitutional conference and debated the forms and structures that will enable this. Here, a representative cross-section of Somali politicians, civil society leaders, and traditional elders agreed to reform the current Mogadishu centric approach of government. We agreed on how this will be achieved by establishing an inclusive parliamentary Somali democracy within a federal system that recognizes the different traditions and local experience of the regions. The Somali people are not strangers to a such system, a system familiar to your own experience here in Europe, a system based on the notion of community cooperation and mutual respect. In the ancient hair or customary law, Somali customary law, we have always had an effective local way of protecting people and property, safeguarding individual and group rights, and securing travel and trade across the country by discussions and consensus. The foremost challenge we therefore face today in Somalia is to rebuild the institutions that enable community to end the, end, to end the anarchy of, of statelessness and introduce a new order, uh, uh, order built on the bonds of the language, culture, and religion that unites us. An ancient Somali brother promises that if people come together, they can even mend a crack in the sky. And today, we are witnessing the humble beginnings of a drive by the Somali people to take their destiny into their own hands and to shape their future. We are under no illusions about the skepticism which this proposition attracts among both the Somali people and the international community. Two decades of seemingly unending humanitarian crisis and inept and kleptocratic leadership have driven many to despair. We Somalis are stubbornly independent-minded. On one 19th century visitor noted that it was a land where every man was his own sultan. This can be the source of enduring strength, but it has in, the more, in more recent times been exploited by the selfish and the greedy to divide the people. Greedy individuals have manipulated clan affiliations, fractured the national identity, and turned the levels of the state into the instruments of self-enrichment. We must now remodel these institutions to become the tools that rejuvenate the national consciousness, the national consciousness uh, consciousness that arises out of our common heritage. This cannot be imposed from outside, nor can it be a lordship of the strong over the weak. We do not seek an order voiced on people by an elite in Mogadishu 
but one that grows out of the farms and villages, towns and cities where our people are congregated. The political roadmap we adopted in Mogadishu last year was the culmination of Somali-led reconciliation initiatives dating back to the after declaration of May 2000, which established the first transitional national government. Over the course of more than a decade, the transition process has expanded to include many who initially opposed it. In 2003-2004, the TNG merged with the rival Somali Reconciliation and Restoration Council to form the tra transitional federal government. Other factions have since been incorporated into the TFG, including the moderate wing of the Islamic Courts Union in 2008 and Ahlus Sunnah wal Jama'ah two years later. It is therefore clear that while the process has not always been smooth, it has nonetheless proved, proved to be inclusive, locally driven, and something that all Somalis can rightly take, take pride in it. However, Gorowe has now shown that it is time to retain both the process and the country to their rightful owners, the people of Somalia, and come August, so it will be. There must be no further ex extension of the transition. It has to end. With the help of our neighbors and friends on the African continent and beyond, we are making progress on the four strategic goals of the roadmap. Security, reconciliation and political outreach, completion of the constitution-making process, and delivery of good governance. As you know, the security situation in Mogadishu has improved considerably since the ousting of Al-Shabaab in August last year. For the first time in many years, the markets and the streets of our capital city are bustling with life and commerce, children play on its beaches and fields, and homes are being repaired, and many today sport a new coat of paint. As I have already said, and cannot stress enough, enough, none of this will have been possible without the help, courage, and sacrifice of the men and women of the AU mission in Somalia and our Somali uh, forces. We already owe them a, a huge debt of gratitude. Much, however, remains to be done. The terror types of Al Shabaab are of particular concern. But as another example of how far we have come, our own security forces and police are managing to stop more than an estimated 70% of planned attacks in the city. Expanding this safety zone of relative security across the rest of the country is one of our key priorities. While we remain in full support and deeply appreciate our moves to expand Amazon, we also understand that in the long run, only Somalis can secure Somalia. As different parts of the country are liberated from the insurgencies, the transitional federal government will need to take a leading role in establishing peace, fostering reconciliation, and establishing the structures for democratic, accountable, and efficient local and regional governance. We have therefore developed a three-year national security stabilization plan that's hinged on the continual work to rebuild the national army, police force, and institutions of justice. The disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration into the society of those defecting from the extremist groups will be critical. After 20 years of continuous conflict, the country is literally overflowed with arms, and many young people have not known peace throughout their entire life. The endless anarchy and resultant grinding poverty has robbed them of hope, restoring their faith in society and reintegrating them back into their communities is a long-term task that must begin now. We must devise means to welcome and assist the rising numbers of defectors from the extremist ranks. We must also find effective means to counter the soul-destroying soul radicalization and extremism that's been spread by Al-Qaeda, not just in Somalia, but in Somali communities around the world. This is absolutely critical if we are to uh, secure the future. We must provide them with ways to make an honest living, which means providing them education and revitalizing the local and national economies to create jobs and cross clan trade linkages, which will encourage inter interdependence and reduce the appeal of arms. Promoting reconciliation is a necessity if we are going to find a way to get past the abuses and atrocities of the last 20 years. The tra transitional federal government has developed a policy and a strategy to reconcile communities in a newly liberated areas which emphasizes 
inclusivity and democratic and participatory approaches as well as traditional Somali reconciliation processes. Much can be learned from, uh, from the past successes including the Borama and Baidoa processes and the establishment of Bundlan in 1998. Engaging the traditional leaders and their expertise also lends credibility to the political and peace building processes. Of course, individual strategies will be tailored to the specific needs of the different parties of South Central Somalia. We are now in the middle of setting up peace committees in the regions and districts of the country whose mandate will be to mediate resource-based conflicts before they snowball into clan and inter-factional wars. We intend to foster a culture of peace and dialogue in and between the various communities. The local processes will be tied in to the national process to ensure that they adhere to, enable and inform the principal national agreements such as the ongoing constitutional processes. As an example of this approach, I have myself visited Galkayo and Goro recently. I also went to Beladwene shortly after it was liberated, the first Somali Prime Minister to do so in recent years. The constitution making process itself will be a tool for conflict resolution and reconciliation. As Goro with demonstrates, the various stakeholders in our society are publicly debating fundamental and foundational issues. As we have seen this include systems of governance, the relationship between the center and the periphery, and the desirability of devolution and decentralization. All this so that government at every level can become more responsive to the needs of all citizens, be they wandering pastoralists, town dwellers, or rural farmers. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now in the final six months of this process. The Independent Federal Constitution Commission has diligently worked over the past few years to produce a draft constitution. A committee of experts is now working on it to finalize and then harmonize the big outstanding questions, the system of government and the nature of federalism we will adopt. Goroway has been central to providing some of these answers. For example, we have agreed on the principles governing the formation of new states to join Puntland and Galmuduk in the new federal structure, as well as on, the, on a division of responsibilities between this and national government. All states will be ob uh, uh, obliged to ensure equal rights to all Somalis living under their jurisdiction. A bicameral federal parliament with a vastly reduced lower house comprising 2,225 uh, uh, members and an upper house of not more than 54 members will provide checks and balances to the national executive. This is part of the ongoing process of local consultation which was lacking in previous approach to resolving the brutal stalemate in Somalia. We will be conducting further intensive public consultations over the next few months. Once this is done and in line with the principles adopted at the first national constitutional uh, consultative conference held in December last year, a national consular assembly shall be convened in May to provisionally adopt the new constitution. A good constitution, while necessary, is not of course sufficient of itself. The new order must be patrested by transparent and accountable public institutions served by leaders and officials of good character and integrity. The former ways can no longer be tolerated. Corruption must be tackled and defeated. My government is committed to the strengthening of Somalia's public institutions as well as the transparent management of our public assets and finances. We are committed to putting in place a framework of regulations to give teeth to these institutions. To date, we have streamlined the revenue collection system and prepared our budget for 2012. We have revived the Peru for investigation of corruption and we plan to turn it into a robust anti-corruption agency. My government also has also initiated a proposed joint financial management board to ensure public money is used in ways that generate social and economic dividend to all Somali citizens. Finally, the new order must be reinforced by social and economic development. We must extricate ourselves from the vicious cycle where conflict breeds both the poverty that leads to more conflict. In its place, we must entrench a virtuous cycle of stability and prosperity. As I said before, this will only come when we unleash the, the creative and entrepreneurial energies of our people. We must put in place the legislative framework to start rebuilding the national economy, 
enabling the regulation of trade, enforcement of contracts, protection of property, and the harnessing of saving for investment. Today, for example, my government is already in the process of introducing a light-handed regulation to govern and develop the viral and vibrant telecommunication sector, which has flourished despite the chaos of the last two decades. Soon, we will have a new law in place that has been developed in close consultation with the owners, operators, and other stakeholders that will provide the, stab the stability, certainty, and common standards that the industry needs to drive the rest of the economy forward. The new telecom law is an example of lawmaking at its best and a demonstration of the serious work, ethic, and intent of my government. And we will do more to enable the rebuilding of our basic infrastructure to connect producers to markets and ports and provide the electricity to power our factories and light our homes. The scale of investment needed is, however, beyond our meager means. We will continue to need the help of our brothers and friends, both on the continent and beyond, if we are to successfully rebuild. I ask that to help us to grasp the opportunity that now so clearly presents itself. As I ask you, continue to partner with us in this joint endeavor. Peace, stability, and economic progress in Somalia are in all our interest. Terrorism, piracy, famine, and displacement are all symptoms and not causes of Somalia's problems. Good and legitimate government that is relevant and trusted by the people of Somalia within an effective security architecture under the rule of law is the answer. This, therefore, is the task we have set for ourselves. It's unspeakably ambitious and the path is full of potential pitfalls, but uh, fortune favors the brave and the long-suffering people of Somalia deserve no less. We have set our hand to the task and we will not return back. Thank you. Prime Minister, thank you very much for a very powerful uh, address and a call for uh, support, at, especially in these crucial six months ahead that uh, face you. Before opening up the floor, I'd just like to ask you a question about tomorrow's London uh, conference, especially against the background of the fact that there are a number of, uh, of other uh, conferences that have been held over the years to deal with uh, the Somali situation. How would we on the outside recognize aside from the fact the conference has taken place, that the conference is a success, and what might happen at the conference that could lead some commentators and friends of Somalia to say, unfortunately, it's been a failure? Uh, a very good question. Um, this is a very important conference for Somalia. A conference called upon by the Prime Minister of UK, an important country, and a great friend of Somalia. It calls upon the international community to galvanize international support for Somalia. So as such, bringing all these important world leaders to a conference on Somalia is a unique in itself. And we expect this to be a, um, a sort of game changer for Somalia. This is the expectation of Somalis from this conference. And um, it has been, uh, uh, I think since November, uh, there was a, a, a groundwork for this conference. And we don't, we, we're not expecting this to fail. We're expecting this conference to succeed because of the effort put uh, by, the, uh, by the Prime Minister and the UK government, but also the willingness of the international community at this time of the history of Somalia to help. Reason being, uh, the problem of Somalia, uh, the, the, as I said, the problems of Somalia, such as piracy, terrorism, uh, anarchy, uh, refugees, famine, uh, droughts, uh, are not unique to Somalia and not, will not be confined to the borders of Somalia. So we have to all hope uh, to uh, contribute and to, and to succeed. Yes, in the front row. Could you give us your name and your affiliation if relevant? Thank you very much for your address. Yes. Yeah? Okay. Uh, my name is Gavin Charles. I'm a postgraduate student up the road at the London School of Economics. My question uh, relates to 
the allusion to Somaliland that was made in the introduction. Uh, obviously, Somaliland continues to ask for full independence. I'm wondering what is your position on the legitimacy or the identity of Somaliland? And regardless of that position, what specific lessons do you think can be drawn from the relative stability and prosperity of that territory? Thank you. Thank you. Very good question. Uh, Somaliland, uh, we support the peace and stability in Somaliland. Although recently, uh, last few months, there were some problems uh, in uh, uh, Seoul and Senag area, uh, and the fighting in Pohol a little bit worries us. Uh, so we support the progress made, uh, the peace and stability in Somaliland, but we as a government has a policy, and our policy is that the uh, sanctity of the inter territorial integrity of Somalia. We also believe that it's our belief, and we hope, that Somaliland will be better off being with us than being separate from us. Uh, we also welcome uh, the, uh, their attendance of this conference, and I hope this will be a beginning for a new dialogue between Somaliland and, uh, uh, and uh, the TFG, our government. Uh, and also, uh, it, it encourages us that they're finally uh, coming to this conference. And uh, hopefully, we will have a time to talk to them and to dialogue with them and start a new partnership with Somaliland. Thank you. Nick, Nick Redmond. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, when you were uh, giving your address, I couldn't help but think of another state uh, coming back from, uh, from failure, uh, Afghanistan. We, the ISS completed a major piece of research last year on Afghanistan, which drew some fairly chastening conclusions about the reliance of the Afghan state to 2020 and 2025, uh, reliance on, on Western military capabilities. Um, looking to your own situation, sir, are you happy with the level of foreign troops you have on the ground at the moment? Do you think they're sufficient? Would you like to see more? And how long do you anticipate on a realistic, optimistic scenario they'll have to remain? Oh, sure. Thank you. Um, you know, we have uh, currently around, uh, I think, uh, uh, 12,000 uh, uh, Amisom uh, troops in Somalia. And I think uh, the Security Council will adopt a resolution that will increase it into 17,737. Uh, including a contingent uh, from Djibouti and from uh, Kenya. Um, so in the short, immediate term, uh, we believe that we need uh, Amazon African Mission in Somalia uh, to uh, help us uh, 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 create stability for Somalia. But in the long term, uh, as I said in my speech, uh, stability of Somalia is incumbent upon us Somalis to uh, take that charge. Um, we need uh, to build a robust Somali National Army, a robust Somali National Police Force, a robust Somali uh, Coast Guard. And uh, that's where the future lies. So we will, we ask in the international community, uh, while the Amisom troops are in Somalia, in this process, uh, we should be building the Somali uh, uh, National Army, and that's what the National Security Stabilization Plan calls for. We know that Amazon will not be with us forever, and we don't want to rely on others for the safety of Somalia, so therefore uh, we have to establish the law and other institutions in Somalia quickly and as soon as possible. Alex Nicol. Thank you. Uh, Prime Minister, I wanted to ask you, what do you think will be the key elements uh, of defeating the problem of piracy that's based uh, from Somali ter territory? Thank you. Very good question again. Um, piracy. Um, we welcome uh, the, the blockade, the naval blockade uh, of the coast of Somalia where the Atlanta, Atlanta, uh, naval operations is taking place, and also the EU never fall. However, the solution of piracy, the long-term solution of piracy, lies inland. The root cause of piracy is lawlessness and poverty. So these two underlying issues should be, uh, causes should be addressed. 
lawlessness because the justice and law institutions in Somalia are very weak, particularly in the coastal communities where uh, 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 piracy is prevalent. Secondly, poverty is a major cause because the opportunity cost of going to the high seas and hijacking ships is zero. However, for every successful attempt, hundreds of Somalis lose their lives. Over 1,100 Somalis are imprisoned all over the world, in Maldives, in India, in Oman, in South Korea, in Holland, I'm not sure in Britain, but in the US. And th these are the Somalis, they have families. So therefore, we have to address the, uh, the root cause, rather than addressing the symptoms. And the root cause is poverty and lawlessness and creating an alternative livelihood for these youth who are taking their luck to the high seas. Thank you. Sarah Johnson. Prime Minister, thanks very much for your talk. Uh, if I may, I'd like to return to the subject of Somaliland. Um, there's not only Somaliland, but also semi-autonomous Puntland. And citizens in those states currently enjoy much higher levels of security than, than sort of central Somalia. Sure. I was wondering, how do you foresee that you can persuade the citizens of those regions back into or into a federal Somalia? Sure. <coughs> Thank you. Very good question. About Somaliland and Buntland, both peaceful oases in Somalia. We, as I said again, we encourage that, that is, uh, safety and stability uh, in these two regions. And the rest of Somalia is following suit. And we are getting there. Surely, but slowly, we're getting there, even in the south central Somalia. Now, in Gorowa II, we opted a federal system. Why? Because we believe federalism ultimately protects the sovereignty of the individual. Why federalism? We, we, brief, uh, we believe that the power of the state should be divided horizontally and vertically so that the power of, of a state will not be concentrated in one city, in one region, in one group, in one clan, and in one political entity. So therefore, the, uh, the reason Somaliland is trying to secede from Somalia is because of the power of the state back then concentrated in the hands of individuals who ultimately harm the citizens of Somalia. So now we are moving away from that, and we opted for this federalism. Okay? And the reason we are opting for federalism is nothing but protecting the sovereignty of the individual, minimizing uh, government as the, mono, as the only entity that has monopoly power on violence to violate the rights of the Somali citizens. So we are minimizing the power of the state to harm the citizens of Somalia. And that's why we think uh, if we have a federal system, a devolution of power from the center to the periphery, will allow uh, uh, others uh, to, uh, to accept that and to join us uh, in a federal uh, Somalia and Somaliland and Puntland for that matter. Yes, you sir, in the third row. Uh, yes, thank you. Peter Asprey, I'm a member of the Institute. Um, can you, just continuing from your last answer, which was very uh, very interesting, I think, can you, can you say a little bit more about how you expect your government in future to be different from the government that collapsed in 1991? Oh, okay. Um, the government that collapsed in 1991 was a military dictatorship. The, the uh, future government, uh, we hope, will be a government by the, as they say usually, by the people for the people. A government elected by the Somali, uh, Somali society. A government that serves the interests of the Somali people. Um, and as, again, um, back then we had a centralized uh, military dictatorship. Now we are opting for a decentralized <coughs> democratic governance. So. Hopefully, it will be a totally different uh, uh, system of governance for Somalia. 
You were last year um, in Qatar, saw the Emir of Qatar, sure. uh, the Prime Minister of Qatar. Qatar has had a very uh, active mediation diplomacy a couple of years ago. It put together the uh, Doha Accord that allowed for the election of a president in Lebanon. It then worked for many months on the Sudan issue in which it had to bring together 21, 22 different groups to achieve some measure of reconciliation there. It was hugely active in identifying uh, groups in uh, Libya that could carry the battle to uh, Gaddafi's forces. And now there's this question as to whether it will uh, engage itself in uh, Somalia. What, uh, uh, what do you expect of uh, uh, Qatari mediation? Is there still something very much on the agenda for you? Uh, or is it something that has uh, uh, moved on as a result of uh, the convening of this conference here? Yeah, uh, thank you. I, um, as you rightly said, I was in Qatar uh, in December last year. I met with the Amir and also I met with the Prime Minister and the Foreign Minister. And Qatar was uh, uh, interested in reconciliation in Somalia. We also believe in reconciliation in Somalia. That's why it's one of the pillars of the roadmap is reconciliation and political outreach. Why? We Somalis believe that we will never and cannot reach peace through violence. But at the same time, we have to make sure and we have to deny others reach their political ends through violence. So any country, whether it is Gaza or Kuwait or others, who will uh, help us in that reconciliation process, we welcome. Uh, so Gadar is trying it, but uh, I'm not sure al Qaeda in Somalia is ready to uh, to take the call and uh, to heed the uh, uh, advice of the uh, of the Gadari government. Uh, if they can do it, if they can succeed in that, uh, we we welcome. Mm -hmm. yeah. Nicholas McLean. Uh, Pr Prime Minister, c could you say a little more about the economic potential of, some, of a mo of more stable Somalia? Uh, which would be the main sources of uh, legal foreign exchange earning? Uh, what are the, your key priorities in infrastructure development and repair? Oh, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> yes. Um, to, um, for economic development to take place in Somalia, as you correctly said, uh, we need a huge infusion of, uh, of financial resources in Somalia. Um, the economic infrastructure in Somalia collapsed. Spe specifically, the infrastructure in Somalia have collapsed uh, because of the deterioration that has taken place in 20 years. No infrastructural development has taken place in Somalia for the last 20 years. But the Somali people are very entrepreneurial people. And uh, they, we have this... Uh, economic freedom in Somalia, whereby now people are getting back. Uh, once they get uh, some semblance of peace and stability, uh, we believe that this will unleash uh, this entrepreneurial spirit of Somalis uh, to, uh, uh, to develop the country. But at the same time, as an economist, I believe that there is a huge role for the government at this time uh, to uh, uh, provide the public goods uh, highways, ports, airports. These are the things that the people cannot do for themselves. These are the things that need uh, resources, whether they from the Somali government and also from the international community. So, on the other hand, uh, I am a minimally, minimalist. I believe in minimum government. Uh, I believe that uh, we should not, uh, people should provide themselves uh, for the, we should not create a dependency uh, where people depend on the government for the things that they can really provide for themselves. You know, uh, remember uh, they say a government big enough to give you everything you need is a government big enough to take everything you have. <laughs> so uh, therefore, we believe a minimum government, but efficient government that can provide the needed uh, public uh, services. Uh, create an environment conducive enough for economic activity to take place. And uh, hopefully uh, we will have that soon in, in Somalia. 
I know you were at Harvard, but I seem to recognize hints of the Chicago School of Economics <laughs> in that last answer. Um, uh, you'd do well in some of the presidential debates in the U.S., I think. Um, uh, you, sir, yes, please. Uh, hello. Hi, my name is Rick, and I'm a producer. Could you stand up, please? Hi, my name is Rick, and I'm a producer at the BBC. Uh, last month, a Canadian firm started drilling for oil in Puntland for the first time in 21 years. What are your feelings about uh, put the potential for foreign oil exploration in the region? Uh, thank you. I'm already smelling the oil. Uh, uh, it's coming. And uh, um, Sure. Um, uh, we believe uh, investment in Somalia, whether it is in oil or gas or uh, other mineral resources, we welcome provided that uh, uh, abide by the, uh, we have to really now put together investment laws in Somalia. We have to put legislations uh, that will uh, put in place of how resources uh, in Somalia will be shared. Uh, you know, a resource sharing arrangement between, for example, the central government and, uh, and regional states. So provided that we have all these legislations in place, uh, I welcome uh, the, um, uh, the uh, investment in Somalia, uh, everywhere in Somalia, whether it's in Puntland, Somaliland, or in south-central Somalia. The Prime Minister of the United Kingdom said uh, when asked about this uh, conference and approach to Somalia that, of course, Somalia is a failed state threatens British interests, and to the degree it threatens British interests, it partly threatens British interests because of the terrorism that um, originates from uh, Somalia that might not occur only in Somalia and the region, but might uh, hit our own uh, shores. And as a result, there has been speculation in the press that there might be contingency planning for uh, military strikes against uh, training camps and hubs of al-Shabaab in, in, in Somalia. Uh, would you uh, welcome uh, such attacks in eliminating a threat in your country, or would you ask the Prime Minister or the leader of other European countries or the United States to desist uh, from such activity over the next six months as you try to advance the governance of your country? Uh, uh, thank you, John. It's a good question. Um, targeted strikes against Al-Qaeda. Anywhere in Somalia, we welcome. Targeted. However, we have to ensure and make sure that uh, uh, protect the life and safety of Somalis in South Somalia. It's our duty as a government to protect the property and the, uh, and the safety and the life is of Somalis. So we have to minimize uh, the uh, uh, the damage uh, that can be inflicted on the innocent citizens of Somalia, but targeted uh, air strikes against Al Qaeda in Somalia, uh, we welcome that. Have you asked for it? <laughs> uh, <laughs> we didn't, but uh, uh, we uh, we, sh we should be coordinated with the uh, with our uh, international partners in the fight against Al Qaeda. Mm -hmm. We will coordinate. Yes. I'm Pekka Havisto, Member of Parliament from Finland and uh, attending tomorrow to the conference. Uh, my question to you is actually a little bit linked to the previous one. Uh, uh, you mentioned reconciliation and the importance and some of the initiatives. How far you can reconciliate, do the reconciliation regarding the, the Al-Sabab or, or Hezbollah Islam? Or where you as a Prime Minister would put, put limits, uh, which groups you could get on board in the reconciliation process? You know, in, in our, uh, uh, we are seeking reconciliation among Somalis. It's part of the, of the roadmap. Uh, Al Shabaab is normal in Somalia. Now they call themselves Al Qaeda in Somalia. Now, so where, where to start? Can we negotiate with Al Qaeda? Uh, do they believe in negotiations? Do they believe in reconciliation? Uh, I doubt it. Uh, if there are Somalis in Somalia who are willing to renounce violence, to sit with us, to negotiate with us, we welcome. As I said, we cannot reach peace through violence. Violence breeds violence. Violence begets violence. But at the same time, again, we cannot allow Al-Qaeda and others 
to reach their obnoxious ideology and their political ends through violence, through terrorizing people, uh, the people of Somalia. We cannot allow that, and we have to defeat that. I'm not missing words in this. We have to defeat this enemy. But others who are willing to sit with us, who are who uh, willing to renounce violence and negotiate with us, uh, I always welcome them. And uh, my government is willing to sit down with them and talk to them. By the way, I want to announce that uh, the Baidoa, the capital city of Bai, uh, is captured by the Somali troops today. Any other uh, questions? Yes, David. Uh, I'm David White. I'm a journalist. Uh, unless I missed it, I don't think you mentioned Kenya except in the context of a possible Kenyan contingent in Amisom. I, I believe you initially opposed the Kenyan incursion, and I'm wondering what your position now is on the prospect of a continued Kenyan presence in parts of the country where the uh, government has no authority. Uh, a correction? I didn't, I didn't oppose the uh, intervention of Kenya in Somalia. Actually, I welcome them. Uh, the reason being, um, Kenya was forced to intervene because of uh, al-Shabaab going inside Somalia, abducting Kenyans and uh, 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 tourists in, uh, in the coastal towns of Kenya. Um, and uh, we were not able to protect them uh, from the menace of al -Shabaab. So therefore, we have to devise a strategy, a common strategy between Kenya and Somalia to deal with this issue. And the intervention of Kenya is part of that, uh, of that strategy. And uh, they are now a member or a contingent uh, of Amazon in Somalia. Uh, so we welcome their intervention, and we are uh, uh, working together uh, in defeating al in Somalia. Any Anyone else? I've had a very good conversation already in the library with the Prime Minister. I'm very happy to ask him a few more, a few more questions. But are there any from? Yes, go ahead. You stand up. Stand up, and the microphone will come to you. There you go. Hi, Alex Stevenson. Um, we discussed sort of the economic schools you might adhere to, Chicago or otherwise. And I noticed your time at George Mason, which has the Mercatus Institute there. What are your economic heroes, and like, where do you see the economy going? <laughs> uh, my economic heroes. Um, I think the, uh, you know, every economist hero is Adam Smith. You know, uh, a Scottish economist. I visited. Uh, I was in Edinburgh in 2004, and I had the uh, uh, opportunity to visit uh, uh, his uh, grave in uh, on one mile between the, uh, the palace and the... And the, and the Roma. The Roma. Yeah, so... Um, uh, you know, um, I went to uh, George Mason, which is a, uh, known for its public choice, a school of thought, uh, a conservative school. On the other hand, I went to uh, uh, Harvard, Kennedy School of Government, which is known for its liberalism. Uh, so... Having these two uh, different uh, perspectives of, uh, of, uh, of economies is, uh, is a good thing, I think, for me. It balances me. <laughs> yeah. Let me end with two short questions to you, and we can conclude, I think, on these notes. Um, the first is on uh, economic aid. Um, normally, in these kinds of situations, you hear calls for a new Marshall Plan or a great infusion of uh, financial aid and capital. Uh, what do you look for in terms of direct uh, economic and financial assistance from the international community? And what specific parts of the international community would you be expecting to receive that uh, aid from? And secondly, normally in these situations, uh, people begin talking about the need uh, to recreate uh, a national army uh, from the various militia and groups uh, that will have operated in the country 
during this failed state uh, status. Uh, what do you look for from the international community in trying to uh, uh, bring together a single uh, military force that has uh, the authority of the state and only the authority of the state uh, behind it? Because unless these two things happen in a proportionate and coordinated way, uh, your hopes for Somalia's future might yeah. be dashed. Uh, let me uh, thank you, uh, John. The uh, first question about aid to Somalia. Uh, because of the 20 years of destruction, the a collapse of the state institutions and state infrastructure has collapsed. So on one hand, we need a massive infusion of capital in Somalia. One is Somalia is safe enough for investment in infrastructure, in productive clusters such as you know, uh, fishery, uh, farm, uh, a, uh, agriculture, uh, livestock, uh, you know, uh, uh, mineral resources, extraction of mineral resources. So, once we get the peace we need, a massive infusion of physical capital in Somalia is very important uh, because uh, we were left behind for the last 20 years. On the other hand, uh, my wife's an expert on foreign aid and she wrote a lot about foreign aid as well as I also did research on foreign aid. We don't believe dependence on foreign aid. Um, as uh, Sir Bitter Power, uh, a very well-known British economist, said that uh, foreign aid is a transfer from uh, poor taxpayers in developed countries like the UK to rich bureaucrats in developing countries. So we don't want that kind of foreign aid because foreign aid, uh, uh, a lot of foreign aid went to Africa and still have, most of the African countries still are basket case, cases. So once we establish peace, investment in infrastructure is very important for us because we don't have that capital now. So our government cannot uh, provide that. But once we have that, then we will rather have trade and foreign direct investment in Somalia than having uh, foreign aid because we have the resources uh, that are needed uh, in foreign direct investment. Um, uh, um, as far as the uh, Somali National Army is concerned, yeah, of course, we have to build a Somali army, not militia. Somali army, that has a Somali character. Means that uh, it has to have Somali character, not one specific area or one specific group. Uh, and we are uh, in the process of doing that. And reason being, because the safety and security of Somalia relies on uh, establishing uh, a, a, a credible uh, Somali uh, uh, national army, a credible uh, Somali national police force, and so on and so forth. So we are in the process of doing that with the help of the international community, actually. And that's why we have this NSSB National Security Stabilization Plan uh, that we are now trying to implement in Somalia. Prime Minister, thank you very much for choosing the ISS to deliver this important manifesto on your vision for the future of your country. I think everybody in this room will have been impressed by uh, the professional technocratic skills that you bring uh, to the office of Prime Minister. All of us in this room wish you the very best of luck for this unique conference uh, tomorrow and for the six months ahead of you in bringing this government uh, to fruition. Thank, thank you very much. Thank indeed. you.